Hello, everybody, and welcome to our, our University of Nebraska Feed Yard Extension webinar series. Um, today, our topic will be uh, related to heat stress, and very excited about our, our topic and speaker. Um, we thought it would be timely to put together a summary of, of considerations for feed yards and especially to get prepared prior to heat stress events, and so we're not quite as reactive after the event or during as we could be before. Um, this is recorded and, 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 and welcome you to watch the webinars in that manner. We would make a request that if once you're done watching the webinar, we would really like to see your evaluation of our programming in general. And there's some specific questions related to heat stress and and uh, what you may or may not be doing for mitigation and, and any needs or follow-up questions you may have. So we would encourage you to go to the web, web address that's listed there, the go.unl.edu feedlot webinar heat stress site. And it's pretty straightforward, take about two, a minute or less to probably do the evaluation. So look forward to getting that feedback if you're viewing this in the recorded uh, webinars. Okay, today our, our guest speaker is Dr. Terry Mader. Uh, Dr. Mader is a Maritai professor from the University of Nebraska. Uh, that simply means that he's formally retired from the university, but we still collaborate and, and he still does a lot of work uh, on behalf of the university and, and himself. Uh, Dr. Mader's research and uh, his research area for many years is related to stress abatement and, and the impact of the environment on cattle. So when we were planning these these webinars, it was logical that to invite him <clears throat> invite him for uh, for his comments and summary of, of what he views as, as reactions or, or preparation to have for heat stress. So with that, Terry, uh, thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it, and and I look forward to your comments. Okay, thank you, Galen, and I do appreciate the opportunity to to visit with your group today. Obviously, the the topic is heat stress mitigation, and I'm involved in in both heat stress and and cold stress uh, activities uh, relative to primarily feedlot cattle, but also do get involved with some other species. Of occasionally and and obviously as, as Gayla did, had mentioned I worked in oh I worked in this area uh, since the early to mid 80s actually the early 80s we had a lot of uh, cold wet weather in northeast Nebraska and then we had a few few hot summers but anyway this slide shows you a, a rough summary of what the losses related losses have been relative to summer heat stress uh, and these are these are things that I could document through various sources uh, throughout uh, the region uh, the cattlemen's associations uh, the uh, the packers uh, producers uh, and for the most part, these are very conservative, and I would say uh, are about they're about two thirds of what the actual losses were. Um, the big loss, which I'll talk about, was the, the summer of 2011. Uh, we had over 14,000 head lost, uh, and then 2017 was a whole different scenario, and that was that was the fires in southwest Kansas, parts of Oklahoma. Uh, and again, those losses probably were closer to 35,000, but clearly uh, pretty horrific and, and related again to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, hot conditions, hot, dry conditions. Uh, interestingly, those were March fires. And I was going to say for this year, um, typically we start seeing some cattle panning in March. We start seeing some some higher temperatures, 70s, close to 80s. We haven't in Northeast Nebraska, they may have in Western Nebraska, but again, uh, when we're coming out of winter with these heavy hair coats, we'll start seeing a little bit of heat stress. Nothing that's life-threatening, but certainly it does occur. And that's important, and we'd like to have that to happen, so then they'll start losing that winter hair coat. We do not want to go into to, uh, June with a full winter hair coat, uh, particularly with those long days. This was uh, 
uh, or a graph of the 2011 heat event. The, the top graph kind of demonstrates uh, what the conditions were the week prior to the, 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 the worst, when the worst conditions developed. And again, typically these, these heat events, yeah, for the most part, there's weather anomalies or some type of frontal boundaries that's moving across the U.S. from west to east. And a lot of times they'll start down in the southwest and then move up into the, into the Corn Belt. And so that's kind of way this manifests itself. The interesting thing about this is, is we lost cattle that I could document in six or seven states. We also had a few little problems with conception rate and some cows. Uh, and we had heat stress clear west, or west, clear to North Platte um, and regions north of there. Um, it is interesting that sometimes that area in uh, southeast South Dakota is, per, uh, is uh, uh, we see cattle get compromised. I don't know, there's some unique aspects about that. Uh, but over the years, we've seen uh, we've seen death loss up in up in North Dakota uh, and southern Minnesota. So this is this was one of the worst ones uh, that we did see. And again, there are I'm not, I can't get in I'm, I don't have time to get into the weather conditions about how these manifest themselves. But oftentimes, uh, we do have a cool, wet spring, and then. Um, conditions turn hot very rapidly and cattle haven't been able to acclimate or adapt to those conditions. Uh, the effects of the extreme temperatures are, are certainly a big part of what contributes to the death loss, but really uh, it, we can adapt most of our cattle to most, most conditions. It's a sudden or drastic change in temperature or conditions that can be just as deadly as the duration or the extent or magnitude of those heat, heat stress events. This is a 2006 event. Uh, we lost cattle in Northwest Kansas, uh, where they had a significant temperature change uh, from the day before. And then we also seen some cattle uh, lost, uh, were lost in Southern Iowa and Eastern Iowa, where we also seen uh, those those drastic changes in temperature and so it's it's not just surely the extremes but it also it's the it's the change in the rate at which that change occurs um, the topic was mitigation and so I'll get into some different mitigation strategies that that we can use and again shade is one of the things that's uh, is most effective uh, in preventing uh, death loss, but also most effective in, in just minim minimizing the stress and allowing the animal to be a little more comfortable. Again, a lot of people say, well, uh, the temperature was such and such under shade. Well, actually, for the most part, uh, the shade doesn't change. If you have any air moving, moving or any air movement, shade really won't change the ambient temperature, but it certainly will change what the animal feels like simply because of the amount of radiant heat that's blocked by use of the shade. Approximately half of all radiant heat from the sky, the ground, other animals, whatever, uh, uh, shade, will, uh, uh, shade will diminish about half of that radiant heat. And so uh, in some conditions that makes the animal feel as much as 20 degrees or the temperature as much as 20 degrees less than what it would be without the shade. This is a date, a very dated slide, uh, 1963, but uh, most of the data that I've collected over the years and the observations I've made and shade studies, uh, it's held up pretty well. And that again, we get the biggest benefit where we have the highest temperatures and potentially the most sunshine, uh, again, in, in the high plains. And so it's Texas, Oklahoma, and parts of Kansas. And then the, the lighter shaded area, there are benefits. And again, for the most part, where the dark area, I see it, where we can certainly, you know, this is a fairly general statement, but see some, see some clear economic benefits on an annual basis. The lighter shaded area, uh, not so much. Maybe we'll see some economic benefit. Maybe it'll be just uh, uh, the animal just being more comfortable until they can get into the nighttime cooling. 
and then but and then the the white area not too much benefit at all however i would say with climate variability i won't say climate change but with climate variability that gray area has probably expanded quite a bit compared to what we're looking at in 1963. And so you need to keep that in mind relative to how uh, or what the benefits of shade may be. Obviously, uh, there's different designs and structures and, uh, of shades and uh, shade types of materials. But again, we need to keep in mind that we don't want to crowd cattle, and so if we put up these structures, we want to make sure we have enough room for all animals. I just want to draw your attention to this one animal in the middle, in the middle to the to the right. He's just where he's using just the shade of this fence post for for to his benefit because he's probably a less dominant animal and he isn't able to get in among the group and to share in the shade, but also. Uh, he potentially could be a sick animal uh, and again has been singled out um, and so he's struggling clearly trying to to uh, uh, eliminate the impact of the heat stress. In regard to sick animals, while I'm on that topic, I would say that most of our sick pens, both winter and summer, we need some type of shelter or protection. It's just essential if we're going to help bring them animals uh, uh, back to, to good health. Moving on to sprinklers and sprinkler management and there are some real issues here that need to be dealt with as far as cooling an animal. It by far is the most efficient way to, to cool an animal or a human being. Uh, if we can put a little water or mist or something on that, on that hide not on the hair, but we want it on the hide. If we can get to the hide, they can dissipate tremendous amounts of heat. The problem is, is that once you start doing this, you need to do it every day until the heat abates. It's just, it's something that these animals become very much addicted to. And if you miss them or uh, during a day or over two days, there's a good chance that they could be compromised and maybe in a more difficult situation then, than had you not done anything at all. So if you're gonna do the sprinkling of these animals, you need to make sure that you're gonna be able to do it on all of them and be able to do it every day. Uh, this is one slide of many, I just pulled this one out. It's not a big study, but it kind of represents what we see as far as the general benefits of shade versus mist or sprinkling versus the control. And again, mist is just a lighter amount of water, probably not a big a droplet. Uh, again, you may not be getting that water to that hide as opposed to a sprinkling system where you get a bigger, bigger droplet to get to the hide to cool the animal. But generally here, a shade provides us the greatest benefit as far as average daily gain, greatest benefit as, pro for, as far as feed intake, uh, and mist not about mist is about the same as control. Sprinkler did fair, uh, but not as good as shade. But in the bottom line, feed efficiencies aren't changed a lot. And again, depending on the length and duration of these heat events, you may or may not see uh, a great economic gain. Uh, the benefits will be in maintaining animal comfort during the during the hot part of the day until they can get to the the cooler cooler nights. Now. That being said, if we don't have cool nights, that's where we start compromising cattle because they can't dissipate that body heat. So if you go two or three days without nighttime cooling, that's when we really see the devastating losses in our, in our feedlots, in our poultry operations, our swine operations, our dairy operations. So one of the things we looked at while I was at Northeast Station was just cooling the ground. This is a, a set of pens that the water had been put on the ground the day before. I think we put on about a tenth of an inch when certain weather conditions manifest themselves and we had that all programmed into our sprinklers. And so these cattle, they came back this the next day and they'll keep coming back to that until that water com completely evaporates from the ground and then it'll start to heat up. But as long as there's moisture on that ground, uh, that ground temperature will be 100, maybe 110 degrees 
Whereas over at the corner of the back of that pen, it'll be closer to 140 degrees. And so they'll find those cool spots in that pen. Uh, water trough management, uh, water accessibility is extremely important under hot conditions. And, and again, uh, in the winter, or normally, we just recommend point that's three quarter or three quarters or one inch of linear uh, water space per animal. Uh, but looking at all the data, and again, we've, we've collected data in Australia, I've collected data in, up there in Northeast Nebraska, uh, but again, the data would suggest that we could use two, possibly three linear inches of water space per head in the summer to make sure that these cattle uh, don't have to compete so hard for those water spaces and can get to it to, to, to drink water. Again, this is a slide where obviously you've got dead cattle close to a water, they probably didn't get to the water in time. Uh, moving cattle, and this is, this is probably one of the biggest mistakes I see both cow-calf and some feedlot producers make, and that's processing cattle in the middle of the afternoon or working cattle or moving cattle. And, and uh, the blue line there uh, is the body temperature of animals we moved uh, during the morning, about 8.30, or during the afternoon and this we conducted this in the in the winter or uh, well temperatures around 45 or 50 degrees winter or spring uh, but any movement any physical activity will raise body temperature regardless of the species and so and it, it goes up real quick it's slow to go down you work all in muscles it still has to dissipate through the body and so again it takes a while to to get back to normal compared to the pink line uh, or to the control cattle. Now, interestingly enough, where we see that dark blue line go below that control line, uh, that's a situation that I've probably seen in four, five, six studies, and that once animals get overheated or warmed up above certain, what we'd consider a normal body temperature, and here we're above 102.5, why then to, they will compensate and they will dissipate heat sufficient amount of heat to where they will go below what normal or control cattle might do. And so this is something that's part of the comp compensatory process. And it is important for these animals to be able to do that so they can uh, thermoregulate uh, that body. Other heat stress contributors uh, are flies, uh, body condition, uh, extra body conditions clearly uh, problematic. We need to keep cattle current in the summer. Uh, where we restrict air movement is, is a problem. Uh, processing activity moving, I mentioned that. Hair coat, uh, we, we did experience, I, I can't remember whether it's 2009, I think it was 2009, uh, uh, mid to uh, June 15th, June 20th, a significant death loss in the in the central Nebraska, central southern Nebraska area, and that was a those cattle that came out of a fairly cool May had not had not uh, uh, lost their winter hair coat, and so again uh, 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 temperatures moved up, humidities came up, uh, winds went down. And again, you you only have to have those conditions on fat animals for about four or six hours, and you can potentially start compromising some animals particularly if it was a cool night the night before and they came in and ate a lot that morning. And obviously the black hided cattle are more susceptible than white hided cattle. So when it rapidly turns hot and they don't have any opportunity to adapt, and the adapt adaptation process is, there's several things going on, but the main ones are they lose the, the winter hair coat, uh, they thin that hair, uh, they do start shunning more blood to the outer extremities so that they can uh, dissipate that heat through the skin uh, and then they also will start to to decline in feed intake and that's a gradual process but if you look at a lot of feedlot records during the month of June and July you'll see that the intake start to go down by August we start seeing um, longer nights cooler nights and those intakes will start coming up in August certainly in September and October and by then, then they're starting to ratchet up intakes to prepare for, for winter. And that process goes on until about the dead of winter. And then they kind of just hunker down for the rest of winter. And you may not see much change in intake. 
and that's where we get into the metabolic heat load. Uh, it's important in the winter to have a high metabolic heat load, not so much in the summer, obviously. And now here are some dietary ingredients that we've used, looked at, studied, evaluated over, over decades. Uh, and there's not any one of these that's a magic bullet. Uh, there are some things here that are certainly could have some potential or do have potential. Uh, they may have more potential in helping the animal recover as opposed to what's happening during heat stress. Because uh, during the heat stress event, you do have a, a destruction of the, particularly the lower intestinal tract tends to be compromised, get leaky gut. There's a whole range of things that occur to that animal. Uh, and part of that going off feed is they've, they've compromised the absorptive process. So when that heat event is over with, they have to rebuild that. They have to get that body, that component of the digestive system functioning. And so these, some of these things, um, like your yeast and chromium, your zinc, um, uh, herbal extracts, essential oils, some of these things may be very beneficial in helping to repair uh, those uh, uh, those uh, those cells in the lower intestinal tract, uh, the mucus producing cells in that lower intestinal tract to get to get the, get it working and functioning normally. And so uh, that's an area that's currently being studied fairly aggressively in some in some places, and is certainly of interest in both human and animal um, areas of of uh, uh, digestive physiology and stress physiology. The last one there is water. If there is one magic bullet, it's water. And if you can get water into these animals, particularly here in the high plains where we get water out of the ground, where it's 68 or 60, 58 to 60 degrees, uh, you can do a lot to help save that animal and keep him. You may not keep him on feed, but you'll keep him alive. And so this is something that, that I've stressed in the feedlots over the years is being able to get more water troughs in there being ha having the capabilities to fill those uh, from the alleyways, and to, so those animals can can uh, get to that water, and then basically they use it like a radiator effect. They drink it and urinate, drink it and urinate, and so it is effective in keeping them alive and on feed. Uh, several neb guides. This is one that I put together with Lindsay Shychester for the livestock shows, but the just before I left, uh, D was and uh, Rob was was working on on another one that's uh, that's out there on heat stress management and mitigation, and so all of these I um, have useful information in them. The uh, down below I've got indicators, and we 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 don't always use these as good as well as we ought to. Um, the human index, the THI, the THI. Temperature humidity index, that's based on temperature and humidity, and that, that accounts for about 70% of the variation is relative to the stress. Uh, Mark has one that's online. It's called the respiratory index, a uh, respiratory rate index, and it's it accounts for temperature, humidity, solar radiation, and wind speed. Uh, John Goggin has one that I worked on in Australia, the Black Globe. It's very good. Dan Thompson, he pre promotes that out of K-State. Um, and then I've, I've developed one um, here oh, 10 years ago, been working on it and, and still perfecting it. And it, again, it accounts for uh, relative humidity, wind speed, both solar and surface radiation. And again, it gives a meaningful, uh, feels like temperature. The unique thing about this is this is, a, this is a comprehensive and it, it it covers a full range, physiological range of, of, of temperature and environmental conditions from heat stress and cold stress. And so I use it uh, to predict livestock performance based on those conditions in the various breeds that we're feeding. And also put some economics to whether, what the conditions may be, whether we can afford a shade or sprinklers or different mitigation systems. And so that's been very useful to me. Uh, as far as that index, UNL Mesonet system does have a cattle comfort index, 
And uh, so it is found on the web for both heat and cold stress. They don't have it on unless they're in, in, unless it's in a stress category, they won't have it up. And I've talked to them why I would, well, I've tried to get them to have an in, in or up on the website in a lot in a broader range because there are some things that I can that we can key on depending on what the conditions were prior to when these events occurred but anyway that's another another presentation uh, but it is available and they adapted that from some work that, that I done down at Oklahoma State and on that on their mesonet system so with that that's all I have and I would entertain any questions at this time I went just a little bit longer than what I thought I would but anyway that's uh, that's a fairly condensed version, and uh, I'll entertain any questions at this time or any thoughts. Terry, one question, comment that comes to mind is you talked about wet, cool springs and uh, maybe increased risk as a result of that. Uh, and, and obviously, we're currently experiencing a bit of a wet, cool spring night. I, guessing most cattle are not going to be acclimated to heat stress at least for a while yet so my question is what could a producer do is there anything really to do besides be prepared if it does doesn't allow an acclimation well you you know the, the the again you go through all these these strategies and and you still need to be able to be in a position and and that is part of the problem until you have the event occur they typically aren't ready. And so again, they get caught off guard. And so you need to be basically in, in a position to where you can, uh, you can get additional water capacity into that pen. You know, uh, that's probably about the quickest thing you can do. Uh, the, the other thing is, is, is we like to, you know, some of these spring events, they get, there's a, combination of things that occur and if we have muddy pens that helps the animal that helps the animal cool down if they get in the mud but sometimes if they get too much mud on the animal then it compromises their ability to dissipate heat so again pen management is extremely critical in both uh, cold stress and heat stress mitigation and so again there isn't one thing there but again the, the waters getting waters out to them and just watching your intake too, watching the weather and watching your intake. You know, I've, I've tried to look at different ways that we could physically or just restrict intake. And I can, I can cut heat. I can cut down the heat stress by taking them off feed, <laughs> but, but you aren't going to tell many nutritionists <laughs> to do that. And and because they aren't they aren't interested in limit feeding cattle, but it will work. I mean, and Shane Davis is one of my graduate students. We've got good data on that. Um, and and so again, that is another thing that you can do if you can watch your weather and you can, you know, you don't have to you know drop them to seventy percent of full feed, but take them down about ninety ninety five percent. And you know, there's some going to be some hungry cattle, and then bring them back up. The feeding this storm ration also. That's another thing we can do is increase the roughage level. And again, there's a lot of a lot of controversy about heat increment, but again, on the, that controversy deals with a different concept. And as far as the overall energy intake of that animal, you add more roughage to the diet, you will drop that metabolic heat load, and that is the problem. So again, there's, there's, there's not a lot of things you can do. It's going to be one or two or three small things. Okay, very good, Terry. Um, if anybody has questions, they can, can stay on. I'm going to stop the recording here, though, and then we can uh, go from there.